We're thankful to God this evening for this last opportunity to be with you this week in worshiping and honoring Him and glorifying His name. I appreciate this opportunity. As I said at the first of the week, there's no greater joy that I have than sharing the gospel and talking about spiritual things with those who love to hear about spiritual things. And I've been encouraged by the way that you've listened, your careful attention to the scriptures that we've looked at, and your interest in worshiping and serving the God of heaven. Thank you for the invitation to be here. I've appreciated very much uh, the kindnesses that have been shown to us. Several of you have had us into your homes, uh, and we've eaten some really delicious food. And we've had some really nice conversations uh, about our lives and about our work in the kingdom. And it's not, uh, you know, the food so much or even being in your home and those nice things that we've enjoyed. But we enjoy the spiritual things and the fellowship in Christ and to know that we are brothers and sisters and we have a common goal, a common Savior, and a common love that we share. That's meant so much to us this week. Thank you for sharing that with us. And many of you have expressed your encouragement uh, to me and Sandy in uh, the things that we've been trying to do to glorify God. So thank you very much. And I appreciate this church and have for a long time. I appreciate your elders. I'm glad that Jonathan is here. Uh, he held a meeting for us not long ago at Eastside. And i uh, just so happy that he's flourishing in the kingdom as he is. And I know you're glad to have him. And I encourage you to hold up his hands. He and Kate are just uh, tremendous people, and you know that. And we're glad that they're working with you here. Well, I want to talk with you tonight, as has been announced, about worship to be remembered. And we want you to go to the book of Nehemiah as we consider this important theme. If I were to ask you what you know about Nehemiah, <clears throat> most people would say, well, at least those who know anything about the Bible would say, well, he's the one sort of who is responsible for rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem after the captivity. And that, of course, is completely accurate. So Nehemiah was still in the lands of captivity. He was the cupbearer for King Artaxerxes of Persia. And uh, he got news uh, back in Babylon one day that things were not going well with the captives who had returned to Jerusalem. The temple had been rebuilt, but nonetheless, the uh, Israelites were exposed to their enemies because there was no wall around Jerusalem. The gates were broken down. The wall was broken down. And Nehemiah became uh, very concerned about his people. He knew that God had brought them back to that land to, to, to honor him and worship him and glorify him as their people once again. Uh, but Nehemiah weeps when he realizes the condition really of the people and the circumstances that they're in with their enemies surrounding them and not really being able to honor God in the way that uh, he deserves to be honored. And so through much prayer and God's providence, Nehemiah is allowed to go back to Jerusalem to head up the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. And it's a monumental task, and he's the man for the job. God, I think, uh, knew what he was doing when providentially and by his selection, Nehemiah goes back and rallies the people together, and the walls are indeed built. We come to Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 19. As Nehemiah has done so much good already, the people are building the walls. He's got the leaders uh, all on board with what's going on. In fact, all of the people of Israel are on board with the rebuilding of the walls. And Nehemiah has been sacrificing of himself, of his provisions, of his wealth, and of his time to make all of this happen. Just an extraordinary leader. Just a, He's a study in leadership, by the way, I think, among other things. He's also a study in prayer. He's a great man of prayer. But what we're going to emphasize tonight is he's a man who loved to worship God and who wanted God to be worshipped in the proper way. He gave so much of himself so that God could be worshipped in the proper way. When we come to Nehemiah chapter 5 and verse 19, he asks God this, Remember me, my God, for good, according to all that I've done for this people. Remember me, God, for the good that I've done for your people, because I've tried to get your people back into a position where they could worship you in holiness and truth without fear from the enemies that surround us and to wholly devote themselves to you. Remember me, God. And he does this amazing job from the time that they start building the walls of Jerusalem to the time that they are finished. The text tells us in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15, the wall was finished 
on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. In 52 days, they built this huge wall around this city of Jerusalem that would protect them from their enemies in 52 days. Now, as you're traveling the roads of North Alabama, you know, they can put up a Dollar General pretty quick, but I don't know if they can put one of those up in 52 days. They seem to be popping up all over the place. But a wall around a major city with thousands and thousands of people in it to protect the temple in 52 days while you're being attacked and conspired against by your enemies that are surrounding you. So you're having to build, carrying a weapon in one hand and, you know, your uh, cement trowel in the other hand and all of that. That's, that's the way they did it. And yet, amazingly, these people, under the leadership of Nehemiah and the providence of God, got this wall built. What an amazing uh, accomplishment. And so I say, uh, without a doubt, that Nehemiah is one of the greatest leaders of all time of God's people. If you look through the history of the Old Testament, you see a lot of great le leaders, but Nehemiah is often overlooked. But Nehemiah wanted to be remembered by God. We do things in this life. Maybe some of us have accomplished some great things. Uh, maybe you've achieved something in the business world, or you had some great uh, achievement as you played sports in high school or college or something like that. Maybe you have a room full of trophies in your house somewhere, of all of the things that you've done in one aspect of life or another. Maybe not. Uh, maybe your accomplishment is your family. Uh, maybe your accomplishment is uh, the house that you live in, that you've done a lot of work on it. Maybe you, you've just got something else in your life that, uh, hate to use the word pride, but that you're pleased that you uh, accomplished. I want to tell you that uh, no matter what it is, it's not likely to be remembered long on this earth. No matter what you've done, no matter how great it might be, no matter how great you are. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the wise man says, there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. I only knew two of my grandparents personally. The other two had passed away before I came into the world. Uh, I knew one set of great-grandparents. Going back, I don't know my great-great-grandparents. I don't know their names. I don't know anything they did. Not one thing. Well, except on my dad's side, they came to America from Germany. That was it. What about you? You might know your family history back generations, but what do you know about the daily lives of those people and their accomplishments and the things that they thought of that were great that they may or may not have done? All of those lay in the dust, don't they? Few things are remembered beyond a person's lifetime. If it goes like it normally does, if the Lord doesn't come again, you're going to live a life. It may be full of great things. You're going to die. You're going to be buried. Your family immediately will come to the grave. They may come sometimes after that, and pretty soon you'll be forgotten, and people will walk up by your gravestone, and they'll see your name, and they'll wonder who you were. And that's life under the sun. But I want you to know that God does not forget. He does not forget anything except a sin if he's forgiven. Your life will go with you into eternity. Nehemiah wanted God to remember the good that he'd done to help God's people worship. That's the basis of our lesson tonight. Nehemiah worshiped and worked with a view to eternity. And so, as we think about his character... I want you to go with me now to Nehemiah chapter 8, a text that we often look at in um, thinking about the great work that Ezra did, uh, because he's certainly included in this, and he's a featured person in the events of Nehemiah chapter 8. In verse 1, all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest, so he's a priest and a scribe, he brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And, and you really appreciate the attitude of these 
captives who've come back and now the wall has been built and they really want to establish their, their culture, their city, their very lives on the law of God and they're, they're insisting that Ezra the priest come and read the book to them and they're all gathered to hear it. And the text says, Ezra the scribe stood on this platform of wood which they made for the purpose and beside him uh, all of these people. Ezra opened the book in verse 5 in, his, in the sight of all the people. He was standing above all the people. When he opened it, all the people stood up in respect for God and of His law. And here is truly the attitude of worship. We love God. We love His Word. We're demonstrating that by this simple act, standing up as that Word is read. And as we're hearing it, many of them perhaps for the first time in many years, if ever, hearing the Word of God read publicly. So the law is read, it is respected, and it's going to be understood and obeyed. In verse 8, they read distinctly from the book in the law of God. They gave the sense. They helped them to understand the reading. And among those who are doing this, verse 9 is critical to this lesson, Nehemiah, who was the governor. Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites taught the people and said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. And they told them to go, there, go home, eat the fat and the sweet, rejoice, for they've heard God's law. And the people went their way to eat and drink and sin por portions, verse 12 says, they rejoiced greatly because they understood the words that were declared to them. What, what, a, what, a, happy, what a happy story, right? <laughs> God's people coming together out of love for him, out of love for his word, and just rejoicing. And, and it brings tears to their eyes, but it, it brings smiles to their faces. And you just, you just feel the heartfelt, as we were talking about a little bit Sunday afternoon, the word of God produces emotion. It is the word of God that's produced emotion in these people. And, and they are moved, really moved. And you appreciate that, and you know the Lord does as well. And Nehemiah is right in the thick of, of all of that. And they obey the word of the Lord. They find that uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles was supposed to be um, celebrated at this time, and, and, they, and they go about the business of, of doing that. And the people purify themselves and they exalt the Lord in chapter 9. Uh, we're given some details about that. They came together. And they separated themselves from all the foreigners in verse 2. They stood up in their place to read again from the book of the law of the Lord. Uh, for one fourth of the day, for another fourth of the day, they confessed and worshiped the Lord God. And uh, many of the leaders of the Levites are involved in all of this. And then they offer a prayer. And I want to read a bit of this prayer to you because hopefully we're going to tie a bit of a ribbon on some things that we've taught this week. You all with me? Nehemiah chapter 9 and in the middle of verse 5, they begin to pray this prayer. Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. For you alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all of their host, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all, and the host of heaven worships you. You are the Lord God, who chose Abram and brought him out of the Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham, found his heart faithful, and so on and so forth. And he talks about, this prayer talks about, and praises God for all of the great things he's done with the nation of Israel from the time of Abraham and even before the nation was until that very day. We referenced that passage Sunday morning in the first lesson when I was telling you about the greatness of God and how you can see the greatness of God in the creation, which is mentioned in verse 6, and then in how God has dealt with man through human history. That prayer is prayed by people who are brought together and inspired by the work of Nehemiah. That would probably not have happened had it not been for what Nehemiah had accomplished in bringing these people together to work for a place to worship, to work for God, and to understand how important it is to honor, love, and serve God. As we go forward in the text, uh, God's greatness is extolled, as we've mentioned. A covenant is made uh, with God to be holy and to support the services of the temple. So we, we, God, we pledge ourselves to be a holy people, to be a pure people, so that we can approach you, so that we can have a relationship with you, because we cannot worship God in unholiness. We will be a holy people, 
and they make this covenant to be that, and then your, te your temple, the services of, those, uh, of, of the temple and all that goes along with that, we're going to keep that up. We're going to make sure that happens. We're going to give the Levites the resources they need, and they make a pledge to do all of that. And we're not going to read all of that for time's sake, but it's certainly there. And you just go on and on in this text, and you see the dedication, the determination of these people to worship the God of heaven and to do what it takes to worship him properly and to show their true love and affection and adoration for him. The Lord is greatly exalted in worship then. When the wall itself is dedicated, the wall that Nehemiah built with the help of the people, you come to chapter 12 and verse 43, they have this big dedication. They offered great sacrifices and rejoiced for God and made them rejoice with great joy. And the men and the women and the children also rejoiced so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. Here they had been not long before uh, a, a humbled people, a people who'd come back to their land to find it ruined. They'd built a temple, but everything else was fallen down and in disrepair. They'd become a laughing stock of the people around them. But now the wall was built. Now they'd come together with strength and might to honor the God of heaven. And now they're rejoicing with such sound that their enemies who live out on the plains could hear the great noise coming from Jerusalem. And the praise of God, the sound was heard afar off with these people glorifying the God of heaven in song, in praise to him, in worship. And to me, it's, it's just an awe-inspiring picture that I see. And I hope you see a glimpse of that too. Again, we're just sort of hitting the highlights of this. Because what I really want to do is get to Nehemiah's personal part in making sure, making certain that God is worshipped in the way he deserves. And tonight, I want everyone in this room to be a Nehemiah, to make a pledge to yourself and to God that I'm going to worship God in the way that he deserves. And I'm going to help others do that too, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. So look with me in Nehemiah chapter 13. On that day they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people, it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it was when they heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. What's being said here? Well, what's being said is they realize that the law of God in the book of Deuteronomy that was written about 900 years before this they realized that God's law said they shouldn't be having to do anything to do with the Moabites and the Ammonites. But a bunch of them had married Moabites and Ammonites. And the mixed multitude was right among them. And so they, they put all of them away. And again, Nehemiah is a leader in all of that. But he says before this, in other words, before that happened, Eliashib the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, so he's in charge of the temple, he was allied with Tobiah, and Tobiah is an Ammonite, one of the enemies of God's people. And he had prepared for him a large room where previously they'd stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the gatekeepers and the offerings for the priests. But during all this, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had to return to the king. Then after certain days I obtained leave from the king, and I came to Jerusalem, and I discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. I want you to get the picture of this. So Nehemiah leaves for a short time, and while the cat's away, the mice will play, and Tobiah wiggles himself into being given a room in the temple area, adjacent to the temple itself. Here you have a foreigner. This wall is built so God's people can worship God without interference from foreigners. And Tobiah, an Ammonite, is in the temple, is on the temple grounds, in the storeroom where the provisions for the Levites were supposed to be. But those had been moved out so he could move in. And Nehemiah gets back and he sees all this and he is beside himself. Nehemiah was not just an Ammonite, but he was a tooth and toenail enemy of the people of God. If you read earlier in the book of Nehemiah, 
you'll find that he was among the people who in chapter 2 and verse 19 had laughed at the Israelites for trying to build the wall. And then in chapter 4 and verses 7 and 8, he was among those who conspired to attack the Israelites when they were building the wall. And then in chapter 6 and verse 12, he hired a false prophet to make up lies about Nehemiah. And then in chapter 6 and verse 20, he sent letters to frighten Nehemiah. Nehemiah is grieved, and he evicts Tobiah. We go on with the reading. Verse 8, it grieved me bitterly. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. I commanded them to clean, cleanse the room, and I brought back into the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. Nehemiah fixes the situation. This is not right for a foreigner to be in the courts of God. This is not right for this room to be emptied uh, and be used by one who was not allowed to be in the multitude, not allowed to be among God's people. You ever, you ever worked on a project, maybe something as simple, ladies, as, as baking a nice cake for a special occasion? You got it all made and it's iced all up and all the pretty decorations on it. And your husband comes in from work and, you know, swipes his finger through that to taste, <laughs> taste the ice and knocks off your topper and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he's in the doghouse when he does that, right, guys? You are in the doghouse because you have worked and worked and worked on that. And, and guys, you've probably worked on some sort of project, uh, maybe, you know, fixing your car up really nice and uh, maybe getting it, you know, painted and waxed and everything just like you like it. And somebody keys it, you know, coming out of the parking lot. Boy, that, that, that just... <laughs> That just upsets you when something like that happens. When you have, you have really put something into making something just right, just like it ought to be, and then somebody just completely defiles that. So Nehemiah had done all of this work so that the people of God would have a place to worship in holiness, separated from the people of the land. And now it's all messed up. It's, it's completely defiled. Well, you can understand, you can understand his feelings. They're very much the same as the feelings that Jesus had one time a few hundred years later when he walked into the temple. Same temple, temple. it had been embellished some by Herod by then, but same temple in essence. Jesus walks into it in John chapter 2, and you know the story. The Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus goes up to Jerusalem, John 2 and verse 13. He found in the temple those who sold oxen, sheep, and doves, and money changers doing business. And when he made a quip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold the doves, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. You're doing things here that do not belong in the temple of my father. His passion for clearing that out, uh, again, is reminiscent, isn't it? of uh, the same passion that Nehemiah had. We're, we're not putting up with this stuff in the temple of God. Jesus has sacrificed so much to build the true temple of God. That's you and me. To build the church, which is God's temple today. And I want to tell you tonight that Jesus has built for himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And his desire, according to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 27, is that she should be holy and without blemish before him. No dirt. Nothing that defiles. Not in his temple. He paid the price of his blood to cleanse us and to make his church what it ought to be. And he doesn't want junk in it. You say, well, I, I, can't, I can't be in his temple then. No, no, you can because he can cleanse you and purify you and make you holy and make you what you ought to be through his sacrifice and through his love. But the things of the world and the ways of the world have no business in the church. And we have got to understand that. The things of the world and the ways of the world have no business in the church of our Lord. Jesus Christ, if I can be so blunt as to say, Jesus Christ did not die for a fellowship hall or a basketball team. He did not die so that the church could be organized to do all sort of social do-goodism or to stand for what some people call justice in the world today in some political realm. 
Jesus didn't die for that. That's worldly junk. It does not belong in the church. And I can list a whole lot of other things, some of which would touch more closely to home than others. But you know what I'm talking about. We need to be a Nehemiah. We see stuff in the church that doesn't belong. No, get that out of here. That's got to be the way we all are. To keep the church pure, to keep the worship of our God pure, and exactly as he designed it, as we talked about in the second lesson, Sunday morning, how God has designed the worship of the church, what he expects and wants out of us as we show our love to him. Let's keep it that way. Somebody wants to bring in something else that's maybe carnal, maybe worldly in its appeal. No, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. The second thing I want you to notice about Nehemiah is that he was a big supporter of those who did a lot of the spiritual work, the Levites, if you will, whom God had uh, ordained to do a lot of the spiritual work around the temple and the priests who were particularly involved in that. And so we go back to Nehemiah now in chapter 13 and verse 10, and he says, the next thing, he says, I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them, for each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. Now, if you've been paying attention, you might know why the portions of the Levites were not given. It was because the storeroom, which was to store the portions for the Levites that the people had given, they were supporting the Levites in their work. The people gave things. They were stored in this room. That's where the Levites would go to get their stuff. But the room had been emptied so Tobiah could be in there. And the Levites had not been getting their support to do their work. So they had to go home and farm. They had to go back to the farm, literally go back to the farm, so, because they were not getting the support that was due them. That also upsets Nehemiah. It should upset us when God's workers are not supported properly the way God has ordained that they be. It should upset us. We're going to explore that here just momentarily. But the law of Moses had said, Deuteronomy 12 and verse 19, that the people were not to forsake the, the Levite as long as he lived in the land. They were to support the Levites. Nehemiah found that the Jews were not supporting the Levites. And so he rebukes the, the rulers for allowing this to happen. As we go on with the reading, he says, I contended with the rulers in verse 11. Why is the house of God forsaken? See, his concern is not just for the Levites themselves, but the house of God's forsaken. The work's not being done that needs to be done here because the Levites aren't being supported to do it. He's concerned about the house of God. Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gather them together and set them in their place. Then all Judah brought the tithe, the grain, and the new wine, and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed treasures over the storehouse. He mentions who they are and what they were doing, that they would distribute these things to their brethren. We today, in the Lord's church, are tasked with providing for gospel preachers. Now, great thing about this, since I'm not preaching at Eastside, I can say what the you know, Bible says about this without fear of somebody thinking I'm looking for a raise. Okay? And I want to tell you that I have not talked with Jonathan at all about how much he's being supported, so he's, he's not behind this. Don't get that idea either. Okay, everybody with me? But we need to be supporters of those who preach the gospel. Absolutely. And here's what the scriptures have to say about that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 14, and please turn over to 1 Corinthians 9, I'll read some more of this in a minute, but just the, the bottom line there that Paul gets to, he says, even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. That's a command of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like repent and be baptized. That's the way the Lord wants it. That's the way he said it should be. I want to tell you that any worthy evangelist, any preacher who's worth his salt and who's really dedicated to the Lord would happily work with his hands to supply his needs. I would do it. Jonathan would do it. Anybody who's really worth being a preacher. Worth his salt, so to speak. But God's point is, shouldn't have to do it. Paul worked with his hands a lot of times. But even as he's writing to the Corinthians, he's basically telling them, I did work with my hands so that you wouldn't have to give me anything because y'all would have such an attitude of problem about it, it would have hindered my work. That's basically what he says. So he worked with his own hands to supply his needs. But he's basically telling them, in, that, in fact, in that context in 1 Corinthians 9, he's basically saying, I shouldn't have had to. God's 
God's people have been blessed materially in this country beyond measure. And there is no good reason that those who are preaching the gospel should be muzzled like an ox or forced like a soldier to work at their own expense. Please look then, as I mentioned, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and read with me the context. He's talking about receiving support as a preacher. Others were doing it. Others were having their families supported, Peter and others. He asked the question in verse 7. Whoever goes to war at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock, do I say these things as a mere man, or does not the law say the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Is it oxen that God is concerned about? Or does he say it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he who plows should plow in hope, and he who threshes in hope should partake, be a partaker of his hope. If we have sown spiritual things to you or for you, is it not a great thing if we reap your material things? Is it a great thing if we reap your material things? If others are partakers of this right over you, are we not even more? Nevertheless, we have not used this right, but endure all things, lest we hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that those who minister the holy things, these would be the priests and the Levites, do you not know that those who minister the holy things eat of the things of the temple, and those who serve at the altar partake of the offerings of the altar? And then the next verse that I've already read, even so the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live of the gospel, which is to say that just like the priests and Levites were supported to do their work, preachers should be supported to do their work, just like the priests and Levites. How much were the priests and Levites supported? What's a fair preacher wage? You know why the Israelites were commanded to give 10% of everything they had? It was to give it to the priests and Levites. That's where that went. You had 12 tribes. Levites themselves were supposed to tie. 12 tribes, each tribe giving 10%. That was to be distributed among the Levites. In other words, the Levites would receive every bit as much, if not a little bit more, if my math is right, than everybody else was. That hasn't been the attitude of God's people in years past. Nowadays, I think it is. But uh, there are some here who have preachers as fathers and grandfathers that can tell you different stories. This is God's will. That just as in Nehemiah's day, we need to stand up for the support of preachers. That if a man is really working in the kingdom, doing what a preacher is supposed to be doing, and Churches have agreed to support him. They should support him at a level that can keep him in the kingdom working so they not be distracted. I'm not complaining from personal experience. I have never, since I began preaching full-time, had less than I needed. I'm so thankful to brethren all through the years who have helped. But I know that's not true of a lot of other men who are preaching the gospel in this country and certainly in other countries, even today. In Philippians, uh, we learn in chapter 4, verses 15 through 18, that when, when churches support preachers, the fruit that increases is to their account, and God will remember it at the last day. When Paul received support from the Philippians, in Philippians 4.15, he's talking about it. He says, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. Even Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. This was all going to the credit of the Philippian church. God was seeing and remembering on their account what it was that they were doing to support the preaching of the gospel. This is fruit that abounds to your account. He says, I have all in abound. I am, am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Earlier on in this context, he, he said, I, I've learned how, I've learned the secret. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. I've learned in all things how to, how to suffer want. 
but also to have more than I need. And then he gets, says the famous line that everybody takes out of context, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And what he's talking about is I can get too much support or too little support, and I'm still going to preach the gospel. That's, that's the point in the context. It could be applied to a lot of other things. I understand that. But that's the point in the context. What did Paul say? I have all in a bound. I, like a bounding is you've got too much, right? Well, that can't be right for a preacher to have too much. We need to cut his pay if he's got too much. That's the way we think. <laughs> but that's, that's not the way Paul thought. And that's not the way you wanted the Philippians to think. To the preacher, it doesn't matter all that much. But to God, it does. To God, it does. Why? Because it's a measure of how much you care about the gospel. It's a measure of how much you care about things being done in churches the way God has ordained them to be done. It's a measure of your love. That's why God cares. So, let's be Nehemiah's. Nehemiah's support of God's workers made him a fellow worker. This is a principle that's taught even in Philippians. Uh, it's taught elsewhere. Uh, it's 3 John, verse 8. John speaks of those who are fellow workers for the kingdom because they helped preachers out. They supported them. They showed them hospitality. They became fellow workers for the truth, he says, as a result of that. So here's what I know. Um, I've been just so blessed to have opportunities to serve the Lord in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different places. And I've got to preach uh, lessons in so many different circumstances over the, as we were talking at the supper table tonight, a few years that I've been preaching. Somebody asked me when I started preaching full-time, 1980, so that's a few years ago. Uh, every, every sermon that I've preached, every person that I've got to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with, every preacher that I've encouraged along the way, whether here or abroad. And again, it's not me, but God's working. And anything I've been able to do by his grace, I know that everybody who's ever supported me has had a part in that. That's what the Bible teaches. You're a fellow worker for the truth when you support those who are working in the truth. That's what Nehemiah understood. And I want you to understand that as well tonight. Let's work to be approved of God. Let's go back now to the book of Nehemiah and uh, quickly look at a couple of other things that happen. Under the law, the Lord did not approve of working on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a holy day. It was a consecrated day. It was supposed to be a day of rest and also reflection on the holiness of God. So in a sense, it was a day of worship, not quite like the first day of the week today. Uh, it's the first day of the week is not uh, the Christian Sabbath, <laughs> but still the Sabbath day was a holy day and there were special things to be done on that day in honoring God. Uh, there were some, if you read here in Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 15, in those days I saw the people of Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens. They brought them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day and I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. And men of Tyre dwelt there also, and they brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. And I contended with the nobles of Judah. I said to them, What evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? This is not right. We're not honoring God. We're not, again, worshiping in the way we ought to. We're not honoring Him in the way we should. You can't do this. You can't defile the Sabbath in this way. He says, did not our fathers do this and did not God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. One of the reasons that God had punished Israel was because they profaned the Sabbath. And here these people are having just got back in the land, built the wall, got the temple, and now some of them are profaning the Sabbath. Nehemiah can't stand it. We're not going to put up with this. So it was, he says, 
At the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded the gates to be shut and charged that they must not be opened till after the Sabbath. I posted some of my servants at the gates that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. The merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. And I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. And he didn't mean I'm going to lay hands on you to heal you either. You know, he, he meant I'm going to lay hands on you in a way you don't want. I'm going to take care of you if you do this again. He says, from that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. Now, you've got to remember, he's the governor of the land, so he's the authority here, too. He's responsible to do this. But he says, I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves, they should go and guard the gates of the city on the Sabbath. And then look what he says again at the end of verse 22. He's doing all of this for the holiness of God, to express his love for the greatness of God. And he says, remember me, O my God, concerning this also. Remember me, O my God, because of my dedication to worshiping you. Nehemiah stopped the people from working on the Sabbath. Again, this principle applies today. There are certain things that need to be done on certain days, certain things that don't need to be done on certain days. You have giving in the Lord's Supper that's supposed to be done on the first day of the week, not other days. There's a proper day and time for it. And again, eating common meals is a great thing. I had a great common meal. Well, it was not really all that common. It was kind of unusual. I had a great meal tonight and last night and the night before, not before that. Great common meals, but that's not what the church is about. That's not what worship assembly is about. Paul says, if any man's hungry, let him eat at home. It's pretty plain. So we understand there's a place and a time for certain things and to keep God's worship what it ought to be. We put proper things in their proper places, in their proper times, the proper days. We work to be approved by God. Work must be approved by God. And purity must be maintained. Uh, the Jews, as has already been mentioned, one of the problems is that they'd intermarried with the people of the land. This comes up again in Nehemiah 13. And Nehemiah says, uh, this can't happen. He says, starting in verse 23, In those days I saw Jews had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. So these very countries that they weren't supposed to intermingle with, they married some, and even from Ashdod, which was a Philistine city. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not even speak the language of Judah. And so it is today among God's people sometimes. Uh, when I listen to young people speak, we're learning a lot of lingo and a lot of ideas and a lot of ideology from the world. And sometimes we sound just like the world. Uh, not just young people sometimes, but some of us older ones as well. And our focus is on worldly things and our speech is worldly. And we use worldly expressions to describe things. And one of the ones that go, is going around a lot and has for a number of years now that I've noticed is, uh, you'll see it on social media or what, whatever, OMG. Y'all seen that? OMG. Stands for Oh My God. It's taking God's name in vain. And people who are supposed to be Christians apparently think that's okay, but it's not okay. The people of God don't do that. It's not pleasing to God. We honor His name. We glorify His name. We revere it. And yet, the language of Ashdod, the world around us, they think it's okay. Everybody in the world does it, right? Everybody in the world does it. And so it affects us. We can't be bringing that stuff. And we can't do that stuff and expect God to be honored by our worship. He's not honored when people come into his presence in unholy garments, which they have sullied themselves and have refused to cleanse in the blood of Christ. Nehemiah rebuked these people, reminding them that even Solomon fell because of the influence of foreign women. He cleansed the people. In chapter 13 and verse 31, the last thing that he says, as he gets the offerings going and mentions the provisions for all of that, setting up the Levites to do what they're supposed to do, very last phrase in the whole book of Nehemiah is remember me, O oh my God, for good. Remember me. Remember me, O oh my God. He says it three times in this chapter. He'd said it a couple of times earlier on. He'd done all this 
to see that God is worshipped and honored in an appropriate way, in a right way, in a way that God deserves. Every person in this room is going to be judged by their works. All of us are going to stand before God. Our works will follow us, the Bible tells us. Our works will follow us into eternity. God will remember. God will not forget. He, he's not unjust to forget your labor of love, the things you've done for him, the things you've done for his cause. He will remember that in eternity. You better believe it. And frankly, I, like Nehemiah, I'm working to be remembered. I'm worshiping to be remembered by God in a good way. I want him to recognize me in the last day. I want him to say, not, I never knew you, but I see you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. Well done. That's what I'm living for. I hope you're living for that too. It's not that we've earned it. It's not that we deserve it. It's just that by his grace and by his power, he enabled us to be there. As we close tonight, as we close this series, let's worship and work to be remembered by God. In the book of Luke, in chapter 23 and verse 42, Jesus is dying on a cross, and there's a thief who's dying next to him. A thief who recognizes who Jesus is. And he says in Luke 23 and verse 42, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You'll be remembered. I'll remember you in the world to come. That's what he told the thief. He told me he would be with him in paradise. Paradise is an interesting word. It's not found but three times in the New Testament. Uh, a few more times in the Old Testament, though not usually tran translated that way. But the word paradise is not really a Hebrew or Greek word. It comes out of Persian. You might remember that Nehemiah had served in a Persian court. And the word paradise comes out of Persian and literally means a wall around. A wall around. And so Persian kings would have these beautiful spaces. They'd put a wall around them, and they'd make gardens and have lovely areas there for guests and royalty to have dinners, and they'd just enjoy those spaces, and it was paradise. And you might remember that Nehemiah went to Jerusalem to build a wall around the temple of God. And you might know that in the book of Revelation, the last two chapters, paradise, where the tree of life is, is described as a place with a wall around. Paradise. And in the middle of that wall is the throne of God and the river of life flowing out of the throne and the tree of life whose fruits are for the healings of the nation, nations. When I was a boy, and maybe you as well, you have a different idea about what paradise is when you hear that word. Somebody says, oh, that was just paradise. Oh, we're going to paradise. And they mean a vacation on some tropical island, right? I mentioned the other day that I, I actually lived for a while on a tropical island as a boy. Uh, we lived on the island of Okinawa, which is south of Japan. Um, I, I can still remember the beauty of this island. I can, I can just see the, the fields of sugar cane, the Okinawans working in the rice paddies, the cherry blossoms that would come out, you know, uh, in the spring. I, I, can, I can just see all of that, the bananas growing on the banana trees and all of that. Our house, as I mentioned the other day, was right on a coral reef. It came up to our backyard. And I remember as a boy lying awake at night in my bed, looking out the window, and I'd see the octopus fishermen, as they floated their little boats on the water, they'd have lights in the boats fishing for the octopus, and the, the lights would look like stars floating on the water. It was so beautiful. And I wasn't allowed to go out on the reef by myself. I was, I was too little. But there'd be days when Dad would come home, and he'd grab my hand, and he'd say, let's go. And we'd walk along 
the reef and out into the shallows. And I remember the, the purple starfish in the tidal pools and the sea urchins creeping along the way, lots and lots of those. Nemo and Dory swimming in the shallows. <laughs> so they have those fish there as well. And I can sometimes still uh, smell the sea and feel the wind and feel the warmth of my daddy's hand as I think about those days. For a long time, that was my idea of paradise. But it's not anymore. Someday, maybe someday soon, I will awaken on a golden shore in a land that's evergreen. And find my way up a crystal clear river to a great throne. And there see my Savior face to face. And there is but one thing that I would like to ask him in that very moment. Just one thing that will be on my mind to say. Lord, remember me. That's all that's going to matter. That's all that's going to matter for you. Or will he say, I never knew you. Let's work. Let's worship God with all that we have and all that we are. He will remember what we do to love and honor him. Give your life to that. Your life tonight might be a broken life. We're going to sing a song. We're going to ask you to bring Christ your life. If you need to do that tonight, please come while we stand and while we sing.